Good morning, YouTube Booktube. This is Johnny. Thought I'd just talk to you. <laughs> Why not get this camera straight? Oh, sh so yeah, I'm just by myself this morning here in West Michigan. It is 9.35 in the morning. It is a Saturday morning, March the 23rd, here in the Hermit Hut. I'm trying to get my glasses, my eyes focused. Uh, so, yeah. So, my wife is gone this morning because she went to help set up a bridal shower at her church. So, I am sitting here in the Hermit Hut. And writing in my diary on page 267, just fed the birds and uh, reading my books this morning as I have been reading uh, The Transfiguration of Christ, Exegetical and Theological Reading by Patrick Schneider, Schweiner. And I came across something that goes along with what I was reading in on the Transfiguration. I, I've been reading you the account of the Transfiguration in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's also mentioned, like I said, in the other Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now John doesn't uh, record the event, but there's an allusion to it throughout his writings uh, in the, the Gospel of John, 1st John, and in Revelations. It's kind of mentioned, like it says, uh, like it, for example, I'll show you, it says in, Reve in Luke, it says, uh, chapter 9, starting at verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And then you, you read, and I think it's in Revelations chapter 1, written by the Apostle John, where it says, if I can... It says, um, it says in chapter 1 of the Revelations, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about with a chest with a golden brand, his head and hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went seven, went, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. That sounds like the same thing there in the Mount Transfiguration. Uh, and he prayed, and the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. So uh, you find these allusions in, the, in uh, the writings of the Apostle John. But it says in Luke, it goes on here, now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And then, uh, and behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, 
which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful, and they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one of those, in those days of the things they had seen. Now, what I was reading the other day, I was reading in the Mount, I've been reading the, the Mount, the Ascent of Mount Carmel by St. John the Cross, and he refers to Moses and Elijah uh, in the vision of God, and it says, let me see if I can find it. I was looking at this morning. Yeah, it says in the Santa Mount Carmel, Book 2, Chapter 8. And he says, uh, Section 4, Nothing which could possibly be imagined or comp comprehended in this life can be approximate means of union with God. In our natural way of knowing, the intellect can only grasp an object through the forms and, and thoughts of things perceived by the bodily senses. Since these objects cannot serve as a means, the intellect cannot profit from its natural knowing. As for supernatural way of knowing, the intellect, according to the possibilities of its ordinary power, is neither capable nor prepared while in the prison of the body the, for the reception of the clear knowledge of God, such knowledge does not belong to this state, since death is a necessary condition for possessing it. God told Moses, who had asked for this clear knowledge, that no one would be able to see him. No one shall see me and remain alive. Exodus 33.20 St. John exclaims, No man has ever seen God, nor anything like him. John 1.18 And St. Paul with Isaiah says, I has not seen, nor hear, heard, nor, nor has it entered into the heart of man. 1 Corinthians 2.9 Isaiah 64 verse 4 This is why Moses, as affirmed in the Acts of the Apostles, dared not look at the bush while God was present, because in conformity with his feelings about God, he thought his intellect was powerless to look fittingly upon him. Acts 7, verse 30 and 32. It is told of our father Elijah that on the mount he covered his face, blinded his intellect in the presence of God. Kings, it's, it's found in, let me see I marked it in my with an index card. You find that account in First Kings. It says in chapter nineteen of First Kings, verse eleven. And then he said, God said, "Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord." And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and, and after the fire, a still small voice. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So that's what uh, St. John the Cross is referring to. And he told our father Elijah that on the mount he covered his face. 
He did this because he did not dare in his lowliness to gaze on something so lofty and he realized that anything he might behold or understand particularly would be far distant from God and most unlike him. So you find these accounts of Moses and Elijah uh, not, not seeing God face to face. Uh, it also says about Moses, it says there in, it says, uh, he says, if we can find it, um, I put it, my, my thing here, it says, yeah, it says here in chapter 34 of Exodus, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two ta tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write these tablets on the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. And then it goes down to verse 5, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there, and cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children and the children's to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head before the, towards the earth, and he worshipped. And he said, I, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let, let my Lord pray, Go among us, even among we are, uh, though we are stiff-necked stiff people. Uh, so the point is, is that God passed by. But what you find, now the, the, what I'm trying to get at is that when you read about the Mount Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appears on the Mount with the Lord, it says, I'm, I like the, I also like the, the account in the Gospel of, of Matthew, which we've been reading, says, I can, now I have to find it again. Oh. So, let's see if I can find it again. says that he uh, that Moses and Elijah talked to Jesus face to face that's what it says now it came to pass here in Luke that behold two men talked with him who were who were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease I think it's in Matthew 16, now that I can remember here. It says, I don't know. It says in Matthew 17, And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. The point is, is that they, that Moses and Elijah wanted to see God, but they only heard his voice or saw him passing by. But here they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, talking face to face with the Son of God. 
they, what they all longed for was to have direct communion and fellowship with God face to face. And here, they, here you see it. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Who is him? It's the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. And so you, you have this, uh, this, like, uh, this kind of vision of what what the saints after death will experience what we all long for as christians is face seeing god face to face not just seeing the his back parts or or some kind of vision but having direct communion with the living god and that's what struck me, uh, because St. John of the Cross, he alludes to this, but he, he is kind of, and he says, yeah, we'll, we'll have this knowledge of God in, the, in heaven. But he doesn't realize that even now, see it says, no man shall see me and, and live, Acts 33, 33, 20. But here, in the Gospel account of the Mount of Transfiguration, we have a kind of preclude or a, a, an, uh, I don't know, a vision or a glimpse of what heaven will be like. Uh, but he says here in the, in the Santa Mount Carmel, St. John of the Cross, in this mortal life, no supernatural knowledge or him apprehension can serve as approximate means for the high union with God through love. Everything the intellect can understand, the will experience, and the imagination picture is most unlike in disproportion to God, as we have said. Well, what I'm trying to communicate here is that we can have the knowledge of God. Yeah, maybe it's not the vision of God that will, will, will that Christians will have in heaven, but here on this earth, in our sojourn, that God reveals Himself to us in Christ. That there is a there is a revelation of of the knowledge of God that we can have right now, and that is what we find in Scripture. When we read the life of Christ, we read the Bible. The Bible is always pointing to Christ. He is the focus of all of Scripture, Old and New Testament. That everything points to Christ. One thing else I noticed when I was reading here in, in the Gospel of, of Matthew, which says, Surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death, to see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And what you find there is, an, is pointing back to Daniel 7, the, 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 the prophecy of Daniel in, in Daniel 7, which is an Old Testament book. And you, you read in chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, Verse eight, verse nine. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, and his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousands and thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000, thousands stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So what we have here is a fulfillment of Daniel 7. That what we here we have uh, 
It says, The Ancient of Days was seated, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure like wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Also it says in Revelations 14, verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and on his hand a sharp sickle. So there's another allusion to the transfiguration. Behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. And you notice that, that the Gospel accounts, when they point to the transfiguration, they mention the Son of Man. So here we have fulfillment of Daniel 7. Here we have a picture of the Ancient of Days, this, uh, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, the coming one, the chosen one. You notice that, that even that is said, he says here, and while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful. And as they entered the cloud, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Then the voice ceased, and Jesus was found alone. Jesus is the chosen one. He is the beloved one. He is the ancient of days. He is the king of glory. He is the son of man. He is the suffering servant. He is the second person of the, of the Trinity. He is the son of God who came, became incarnated that he might take upon flesh that he might go to the cross and be crucified and suffer the, and become sin who know no sin. That's what this, we're headed towards Passion Week, Resurrection Sunday. And this is what I'm, I, is always on my mind these days. And when I, so when I read here in the Gospels, the Mount Transfiguration account, it, it really adds richness and a depth to the experience of the Passion Week and of the Resurrection. But it really struck me that, that Moses and Elijah, they wanted to see God face to face. And here they are, standing on the mount, and they see, and behold, two men talked with him, and were, were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. So here they're having fellowship and communion, Moses and Elijah with God on the mount. What they've, and uh, that just really struck me. And uh, so I just thought I'd share that with you. So that's why, I'm, yeah, today, you know, it's a Saturday. I'm reading a Transfiguration, exegetical and historical reading. Reading St. John of the Cross, the Mount of Carmel. So I just really, uh, because another, you know, you talk about the vision of God. One verse I really like was you talk about First John. I always like this verse in First John. It says in chapter three of First John, "Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed in us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the word the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God." And and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So it says here at his coming on the cloud of glory, we know that when he is revealed at his second coming, we shall be 
be like him, we shall be totally transformed and glorified and we shall see him, we shall see God, Father, Son, and Spirit as he is, him as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself. Why? Because God is holy and we must seek to be holy. We must ascend the Mount of Carmel and detach ourselves and pursue God above everything else. It's like that you have the pearl of great price there in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the pearl of great price. When the merchant found that pearl, he sold everything that he had that he might have that pearl. And that's where we are as Christians. When we see that the preciousness of Christ and the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and, and salvation and the riches of Christ, everything else falls away. And we seek to be pure as God is pure. And we, and we long to see that same kind of communion that Elijah and Moses had on the Mount Transfiguration. When they talked, they communicated and talked with Jesus about his upcoming death on the cross, his crucifixion, him accomplishing the second exodus and delivering all his people from the slavery of sin and setting them free to have eternal fellowship and communion with the exalted Lord Jesus and the persons of the Godhead. So anyway, I thought I'd share these thoughts with you this morning, hoping you're having a good reading weekend. And I'll close to read and write and seek the Lord. Until next time, bye.